Good morning and welcome to our Amazon Web Services Media and Entertainment Cloud Symposium. My name is Ben Masick and uh, I am a worldwide business development lead for media and entertainment here at uh, AWS. And we're very excited about uh, a great agenda, a great uh, series of speakers, presenters uh, focused on this industry. I'll start off by providing uh, just a quick overview of some industry trends that we're seeing throughout the industry. Uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit about some of the many new services. We'll have uh, Professor Shaquille actually provide uh, that uh, overview. He is our AWS uh, Media and Entertainment Tech Lead. Uh, and Usman will be then followed by Chris Kouton, who is our Business Development Lead for Media and Entertainment Solutions. He'll be talking about a lot of the many new solutions that we've been rolling out over the last uh, 10 plus uh, months. Following Chris, we have an excellent keynote. Uh, we have Josh Wiggins with Gray Benna, who's gonna be talking about uh, just a, a very cool use case uh, focused on mostly machine learning, use of uh, elemental media services uh, as well. Uh, and this is a project that uh, Josh and his team working with Elemental worked on for Sky News uh, in reference to the uh, royal wedding. Uh, but you'll uh, very much enjoy that. We'll break for lunch at uh, 12 noon. And shortly after lunch, from one to four, we'll have two separate tracks. I won't go into the detailed agendas uh, just yet, but uh, track one will be all about uh, content production and we'll uh, give uh, a little bit more instructions later, but I believe that's gonna be happening in the Amundsen room uh, next door. Uh, and then track two will be all about content distribution and that'll be uh, done uh, right here at uh, one o'clock. So once again, at 12 noon, we'll all be leaving this room. We'll uh, be grabbing lunch uh, somewhere uh, down that way. Uh, and then starting at one, we'll reconvene in two separate locations. One for track one, which is all about content production, and then secondly, in a different room for content distribution. We're seeing, we're experiencing an enormous amount of change throughout the industry. Uh, something that uh, I think all of us are feeling, whether it's on the content creation side, uh, where we're needing to uh, reinvent the many ways in which content is being produced, we're also seeing an enormous amount of change directly driven by the way content is being consumed. And we've got a few stats to uh, really just help illustrate the pace at which uh, these changes are happening. First off, uh, the amount of cord cutting, the number of cord cutters in the US uh, is now uh, hit the 33 million mark. That is 3.8% higher than where we were a year ago. Uh, and a year prior to that, we grew at about 3.4%. So we're actually seeing an acceleration in this overall trend of cord cutting, especially due to the fact that most of our consumers are wanting to experience more streaming type capabilities. We're also seeing an increase, gigantic increase, actually a fourfold increase in the amount of content choices our many consumers, viewers now have access to. So that's uh, grown fourfold in the past decade. Very meaningful to many of you in this room is also uh, just the increase in complexity, uh, the higher number of different types of distribution formats, different versions uh, that are needing to be put together. Uh, that are being uh, processed, packaged, and uh, delivered for uh, distribution. Uh, that number has increased to uh, 234 uh, for Disney films uh, that ultimately need to find a uh, way to uh, the many different distribution uh, OS and device uh, needs. And finally, another important trend that we're seeing has to do with personalization. We'll talk throughout the day about uh, personalization in terms of what uh, content is being recommended, uh, what kind of content uh, is being produced based on uh, user data that uh, is being received. And also, uh, at times, we'll also talk about uh, monetization and personalization around targeting ads. Uh, one of the bigger reasons why AT&T Randall Stevenson uh, was so set on uh, his recent purchase of uh, Time Warner has to do with this ability to actually increase the amount of revenue uh, at uh, about a three to five fold increase over what traditional ads can get. So having that targeted ad can directly impact and directly help uh, just a upsurge in uh, revenue. 
If you think about where we're going as an industry, we're beginning to see and get more clarity in terms of just this convergence between content and end viewers. If you look back at uh, most of uh, the progress and evolution that we experienced uh, during the 20th century, uh, from a business model perspective, uh, things were fairly static. You had sort of a, a set of groupings of uh, studios, of content producers, uh, who might also have uh, distribution uh, capabilities. Uh, you had a variety of intermediaries who then would take this content, would prep it, would get it uh, ultimately into the different venues that could cater to the end viewers. And most of this was primarily a one-way path from content studio makers all the way through to uh, the different viewers, whereby the studios uh, and a lot of the content creatives didn't necessarily get as much feedback uh, back from the uh, end viewers. And of course, what we're seeing nowadays, and much of this is being prompted by just newer technologies, a lot of those technologies uh, being now uh, based in cloud environments, this tech-enabled change is allowing viewers to find new ways to better access content, to drive for more niche content, to uh, ask for more personalized experiences. And once again, so much of this is being directly enabled through a lot of the technologies that we'll be talking about uh, throughout the day. Uh, machine learning, media services, more elastic compute, uh, near infinite uh, scale out of storage, over the top streaming, AR, VR, uh, and so on. And what this uh, ultimately means from an industry perspective, in terms of the business changes, in terms of the impacts to so many of us uh, in this room, is that these different uh, viewer trends, these uh, different drivers, more content, more streaming uh, content uh, choices, and more personalization, are having a direct impact in terms of how we run our operations, in terms of our need to be able to uh, uh, deliver on a more global scale, to be able to uh, have more facilities to automate uh, more of the creation of uh, this content, the localization of this content, to be able to produce and distribute uh, more of that content, to connect more directly with uh, consumers. And so throughout the different presentations, you'll hear a lot about the ways in which AWS can help with a lot of these changes. Uh, you'll uh, hear from a few customers uh, on this uh, slide right here that represents uh, some of our studio customers, some of our sports rights uh, holders, pay TV customers, uh, post-production houses, publishing uh, uh, houses, and uh, many others. And much of what you're gonna see is that the trend uh, is shifting to an all-in for media as well as IT and enterprise uh, shifts uh, to uh, cloud. So what we're finding with a lot of our customers is that they're not only coming in just for distribution purposes, for OTT, they're really coming in to be able to experience an all-in move to cloud. And we're seeing this from the up, uh, from some of the uh, early stages of content creation, post-production, that uh, also is ensuing throughout the digital supply chain, the various ways of storing content, of managing a lot of that content through digital asset management, media asset management, and others. All of that uh, is now easily enabled through uh, cloud. And then finally, the many distribution processes where a lot of the cloud evolution started during the early days with things like uh, over-the-top streaming uh, are, are certainly happening. Uh, we also see great examples now of traditional linear broadcasters actually generating their linear broadcast streams running on AWS. Publishers also are doing quite a bit uh, with this uh, nowadays uh, as well. And one of the bigger changes as you look at this media life cycle from left to right is the advent, uh, really over the last uh, two years especially, and certainly over the last 12 months, the excitement that we're seeing from many of you around the advent of machine learning and smarter data analytics. And what this is really providing is just a better ability to take advantage of a lot of the data that you've been collecting over time uh, to make better decisions. And much of what we're seeing throughout uh, this value chain is that a lot of our customers are now taking advantage of these new ways of transforming their operations. The move to cloud is not necessarily just a wholesale migration of IT and enterprise uh, over into a cloud environment. 
much of what we're seeing from many of the folks in this room and many of our customers worldwide is this desire to actually take advantage of many of the new differentiated benefits that AWS and our many cloud partners uh, provide to help with the operations and performance of these many uh, workloads in a cloud type, type environment. And I'll uh, just finish off uh, quickly on this uh, last slide. Uh, at the end of the day, as you know, AWS is a customer-obsessed uh, company. We want to make sure that we're providing our customers with the many choices that you need in order to make the best decision for you. And so the many ways in terms of how many of you are ultimately adopting cloud is going to vary. The commonality, of course, is that uh, most of you are leveraging compute, storage services, database, and many of the other uh, core services uh, as a whole. But the manner in which you might be implementing, prototyping, developing, uh, and ultimately uh, running a lot of your workloads as well as IT services in a cloud type environment uh, can be one of threefold or even a combination of either leveraging a lot of the new media products uh, that we've been uh, putting together. And Usman will be talking quite a bit about our media services, for instance. We've been doing a lot as far as med uh, machine learning services focused on this industry. A lot also coming from Thinkbox. You'll hear a lot about that in track one uh, this afternoon. So certainly a lot of our customers now more and more are leveraging a lot of the investments that AWS has been making uh, in this industry. But probably uh, just as importantly, or more importantly, our partner ecosystem is strong. It is continuing to increase. We're working with more and more partners, making sure that uh, those partner solutions are well adapted, well architected uh, in an AWS uh, type environment. And then also continue to work with many customers who have strong media technology benches and want to continue on with their custom development. Uh, but I will uh, go ahead and turn things over to Professor Shaquille, who uh, once again is going to give you a quick overview of some of our many new services. Good morning. So my name's uh, Usman Shaquille, not Professor Shaquille, as Ben says. <laughs> I'm the uh, worldwide tech lead for media and entertainment for AWS. And I'm here today, I'm gonna talk about what's new on AWS uh, that is relevant to media and entertainment workloads. So 1,430 major features, launches, services uh, in the past year. And we're kind of say in the mid this year, we are already past that number. So I'm not gonna talk about you know, each and every single sort of say nitty gritty detail here, but what I wanted to, uh, talk about today or what I thought would be relevant here would be how some of these features are going to be very applicable to the way customers like yourselves run media and entertainment workloads on AWS. And at AWS, the, the goal of my team is to really work with these services teams that are actually building these products and services and features to kind of listen from the customers like yourselves, what are the needs what are the specific needs for these media and entertainment workloads? How do you implement those in the cloud and how we can make it easier for you to be able to leverage uh, AWS Cloud? So I'll start with um, AWS Elemental Media Services. So this is a set of newly launched media services that were announced late last year at AWS reInvent. How many of you, just a quick show of hands, have heard about this before or kind of had a chance to kind of play with these? Yeah, a decent number of people, so I won't go through a whole lot of details here, but the idea here is that we're taking the broadcast quality video services that were available or that are still available as sort of say your broadcast equipment or appliances on premises and moving them seamlessly over to the cloud. With all the feature set that was available to you as those appliances, now you have available in the cloud with a click of a button, with integration with all the great features like identity and access management, encryption, all the storage services, all the great networking or the scalable infrastructure that AWS provides is all available to you with the video services layer on top. So just to kind of quickly recap, there is five new services that were launched. Uh, the first one being the Elemental Media Convert which is basically a uh, transcoding and coding service. Um, we launched Elemental Media Live, which is actually a live 
uh, streaming origination or live server. Uh, Elemental Media Package, which is basically a, a fully managed packaging solution. Elemental Media Tailor, um, Media Services Media Tailor, which is basically the capability to do server-side ad insertions. And then finally, Media Store, which is actually a high-performant origin store for live streaming. So as shown on the diagram here, you can see both for file-based and live streaming workloads, these services gives you these building blocks to seamlessly build highly scalable, high-quality video workloads. Within media services, there's, while there's a lot of stuff you know, that uh, is needed to kind of bring these services live as AWS, uh, individual AWS services, there's a lot of stuff that's happening behind the scenes still focused on a lot towards video quality. So encoder quality updates, QVBR being one of the key ones that allows our customers now to save up to 50% of storage and delivery cost without sacrificing on quality of the video. Uh, Multipedia dash support that was just recently launched in media package. Um, this allows you to partition the manifest files into multiple periods to indicate boundaries between ads and main content. So a key feature that our customers were looking for. Um, we did a lot of work in terms of integrating or native integration between machine learning services. So there's a bunch that we will talk about with respect to machine learning. But how do we then take these machine learning services and give you seamless integration with these fully managed media services? So let's say if you're doing a live streaming using Elemental Media Live, then how can you actually tag different sort of say actors or celebrities, et cetera, in that particular scene. And we'll hear from uh, Josh uh, with respect to the keynote today, you know, how they did that for the royal wedding. Did I just give that up? I think it was published. <laughs> so then um, there is also uh, uh, a bunch of solutions that we are building, basically taking these building blocks and kind of combining those together as fully developed, turnkey solutions that could be launched as one-click deploy, quick starts, or templates. And Chris Catan, my colleague today, will talk about a bit more about it in more detail. So some of the customers that are already using this, um, uh, this solution or media services, um, uh, TVNZ, that builds wall-to-wall -wall coverage in the cloud for Commonwealth Games. We have Sky News um, that did actually not just the live streaming of the Royal Wedding, but also tagging these celebrities while they appear uh, on the camera. Um, then there is other examples in the sports use cases. For example, Arts Build Web uh, connects with fans through OTT services using media services. Moving on to storage, uh, you probably heard this one as well, but recently we launched this new tier, um, S3 One Zone um, uh, Infrequent Access. So what that allows you to do is, it actually now takes all the different options that S3 gives you and adds yet another sort of say use case from a customer perspective. So imagine the days when we had just S3, right? All kinds of content, whether that is cold content, cold archives or your production archives or your distribution archives, everything you were required to just put in S3 or that was the only solution that was available out there. We heard from our customers. Customers wanted us, to give them a solution for cold archive. You saw Glacier. Uh, customers wanted us to give them capability where they could have you know, infrequently accessed content. So things like, say, your mezzanine assets that are gonna be transcoded once. Why should I pay for you know, large source of retrieval charges for that? So we gave S3 infrequent access. We heard from our customers where they wanted to create cross-regional content lakes, this whole concept of content lakes, right? How I can have a single source of truth or a content repository in one location, and then I could create you know, multiple cross-regional kind of, say, um, content lakes that my local teams can access. Where I don't need that durability, I can really save some money with respect to that, and that's really what um, one zone infrequent access does. So there is several different use cases that we are hearing from our customers, both in content production, content distribution and delivery space, and very excited about this launch. So this is where the whole idea of content lakes becomes uh, much more relevant, right? Where you have, again, your single uh, source of truth with respect to your content in the cloud. And then you have all your metadata, your asset management, 
uh, metadata with respect to the stuff that comes with the content, but also automated metadata, machine learning, all the different applications that you're going to be able to leverage in the cloud, all living together, giving you a unified search. Or an API ab abstraction that can then be used with your day-to-day -day applications, things like your asset management systems, or other things like your supply chains for your order management, and all that stuff. Some of the customer examples here um, that you see some of the very large-scale asset management systems, or say archives, uh, that are actually being migrated over to AWS Cloud in the form of content lakes. S3 uh, has done a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, one of the things, if you are a user of S3, you would know it's an object store. And the object store has a sort of, say, a specific set of APIs that you use to access, meaning reading and writing content or data in the object store. So when our media customers started looking at S3, you know, uh, there was very quickly, well, given that it gives you this durability, this high scalability, I don't have to go provisions, pre-provision storage, and it's highly scalable and very, very cost effective. We saw, you know, a spike in terms of different use cases from customers using S3, not just for st static content store, but also for things like, how can I use it directly with processing? Let's say, can my transcode or encode workflow start running directly from S3? Can I have my quality check directly running from S3? Even to a point where customers started looking at using S3 for live content, where you have you know, a very high transaction per second uh, kind of say, uh, requirements. So in the past, S3 used to uh, give uh, 300 transactions per second per client. Uh, recently, S3 team did a lot of work on it, and as you can see here, we have over 3,500 requests per second to add data, which is actual writes, and over 5,500 requests per second to retrieve data, which is gets or reads. Now, that right there changes the game with respect to the applicability of object store towards this variety of use cases within media and entertainment. And by the way, these numbers are per object, per prefix, and it's increased performance per client. So just imagine if you have sort of say a set of transcoders, I don't know, a whole transcoding form, hundreds of transcoders that are trying to access content, read and write from S3. These numbers are per, per client, right? So it basically gives you that ultimate scalability that you're gonna need. Um, elastic file system, that's, that's our fully managed shared file system. Right? So we launched EFS a while back, um, and the way EFS works, since there is no sort of say uh, limits with respect to how much storage and how much uh, sort of say throughput that you can have on EFS, it was kind of linearly scaled with the, with the storage or the amount of data that you're using on EFS. So back, you would have sort of say, uh, uh, have an EFS volume, and as that EFS volume grew, you will see better throughput or better performance. So with that, uh, you know, many of, the, uh, many of our customers are looking for several gigabits per second sort of throughput. So in that case, for example, in the case of VFX rendering workloads, so in that case, customers had to pad their file system, right? So right there, the requirement was, well, why should somebody have to pad the file system? This is like, you know, uh, not really natural. Why don't we give customers what they really need with respect to the throughput perspective. So now, as a, the customers can now go, when they provision their EFS volume, they can actually say they want a specific amount of throughput. And right from the provision point, they get that throughput. EFS also gives them now the capability to kind of sync from S3 and back and forth, right? So that's, that's a big plus. Now, uh, from that perspective, uh, customers, don't have to sort of say, as I said, pad for specific storage. They get that throughput. And the key aspect there is this throughput is not just, you know, you, you get it once and it's, it's there. You have to pay for it. So kind of think of the case where you have your render workload. You want to keep your content inside of your EFS file system, a shared file system, and you have your renderers or the transcoding farm all kind of accessing this content, right? Now the work is done during the day. At nighttime, you don't need to keep this throughput. So after every 24 hours, you can basically decrease that throughput and not have to pay for it. 
So that's a key feature that customers were asking for that we delivered. Um, Snowball uh, was launched a little while ago, as you guys know. Very uh, sort of say attractive service, if you will, for large amounts of content ingest uh, into the cloud. We've seen uh, adoption in many different use cases from just lift and shift and movement of these large scale content archives or content lakes into the cloud, but also at the same time, things like you know, onset productions. Uh, you know, customers asking us specifically, hey, can I take Snowball to a remote location and use it as an onset production, and move it into the cloud? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we launched this new feature set with Snowball where now the Snowball Edge devices come equipped with an EC2 instance. So you can do some on-site uh, sort of say pre-processing of the content. Say, you know, you want to, uh, the, the, the content that you want to ship, in the uh, ship to the cloud, you want to do things like checksum or some kind of pre-processing like uh, some metadata extraction or even, you know, trying to figure out what is it in this content. Should I be sending the entire file over, which is multiple, you know, hundreds of gigs or, you know, can I send in a subset to the cloud? So it enables a lot more use cases right there for you. In addition to the different types of EC2 instances that you can see on the table there, so we have multiple different flavors that you can request with the Snowball Edge, it also supports Lambda, the Lambda functions, right? So then you can have this workflow starting on-prem even before it has even made its way to the cloud where it can trigger Lambda functions that, hey, I have ingested this file in Snowball, now it's in transit to go into S3 Maybe there is some processing that can start happening, some notifications that can start going. So again, enables a lot more uh, from a production uh, workflow perspective. A lot of stuff happening in the machine learning space. So Chris Catan will talk about a lot of the solution specific stuff that we are doing um, you know, with respect to creating these solutions using these building blocks. But some of these services here, there was a bunch of stuff that was launched with respect to that. I'll start with the Amazon Deep Lens, which is basically um, the world's first deep learning enabled video camera for developers. So the key uh, piece about it and something that I really like is that it's really integrated with the rest of the machine learning stack that AWS has. So what you will see is that uh, customers can then build custom models in SageMaker, for example, move them into the DeepLens camera, and now you have your custom model running on top of DeepLens. There's a, a lot of other stuff that were launched, like from you know, multiple different languages on Translate to additional features on SageMaker, et cetera, that I won't go through, uh, but we'll talk about in the context of solutions. Some of the customers that are already using machine learning uh, uh, today, so, Last year for the NFL, uh, they did their next-gen stats on AWS. Uh, BAM, uh, ML BAM, uh, or previously BAM Tech, actually uses machine learning and uh, machine vision and radar tracking uh, for player and ball movement and actually doing real-time analysis on screen. Formula One, very exciting. They just recently announced partnership with AWS where they will be using AWS machine learning to enhance its race strategies. Uh, data set. So very exciting stuff there. Um, a few other examples in the, uh, um, in the media specific use cases from Vidmob to C-SPAN and Condé Nast, from image recognition to data analysis, et cetera. And then there is a whole lot around data analytics itself, you know, which is application with machine learning, but other aspects of data analysis like Hadoop and EMR, et cetera, and data lakes, and some of these customers um, have some really key use cases from uh, you know, actually analyzing the data for recommendations engines to building bots for queries, et cetera, and reporting. On the compute side, um, how many of you heard about the bare metal announcement and the Nitro hypervisor? Yeah, a few people. Um, so these, we, we recently launched uh, these two new instance types that are based on the bare metal architecture that we have. So the Z1 instances, uh, which is basically the highest sustained turbo CPU clock speed in the public cloud today. It uses a custom Xeon uh, processor with the speeds up to four gigahertz. So think about the cases where you want very high performance uh, for high scale VFX rendering, transcoding, simulations, all those types of workloads, right? Very applicable, gives you a 
instance boost at, a, at basically a much better price point compared to whatever was available before. R5 instances, these are the next generation high memory types of instances. We also launched uh, in some of these new generation instances, you're gonna start seeing this character called D, right? So what that is, is basically we are offering local NVMe storage, which is directly attached to the instance itself. And it, it comes free of charge, basically. It's, it's a part of the instance cost itself. And you can get up to 3.6 terabytes of NVMe-based SSDs that are locally inside of that EC2 instance. And CPU options, this is a very uh, interesting one as well. Again, very applicable to high-performance compute or VFX rendering type of workloads, where now you can actually launch, uh, A, first of all, you can turn hyper-threading off uh, on EC2 instances with this particular command. So certain applications that are not well-tuned for hyper-threading or don't like that, you can actually turn it off for better performance. But at the same time, you can now say the threads, the total core count, and the threads per core for a particular instance type. So a lot of times our customers from a render side, they would complain, well, yeah, I've got this instance, but I don't know how to really optimize it. It's, gi it's giving me extra number of cores. Well, yes, but now you can say, if you were able to use a 16 core machine, you can now use a 32 core machine and actually run two jobs or two threads per core there. So enough of the nerd show here. Um, on EC2 spot side, uh, a lot of new stuff that we launched um, specifically around the EC2 spot model itself that the price doesn't fluctuate that much. Uh, but at the same time, we also launched the hibernate functionality for EC2 spot. So, what that allows you to do is, in the case there are any kind of, say, terminations, because spot is demand supply based, right? Um, so you can actually hibernate your instance and then restart where the job uh, stopped. On the networking side, AWS DX gateway or Direct Connect gateway, that gives you the capability to connect to all the different AWS regions from a single DX connection. So today, let's say if you are connected from one Wilshire here to SFO region or uh, PDX region, well, that same DX can now give you the capability to go to any of the AWS regions worldwide. So this opens up a lot of potential for our customers, and I give you uh, one of the examples that uh, one of the customers uh, recently used. Amazon VPC now allows you to bring your own uh, IP address space. So let's say you have an application that is pre-configured, whitelisted for specific IPs, et cetera, from security perspective it will run uh, seamlessly on AWS. And there's a lot that was done on the networking side, the pure networking side, infrastructure networking side, between EC2 instances and across. So to now you get 25 gigabits per second of uh, elastic network adapter based on enhanced networking between select instances. There's a lot of work we're doing with the, uh, on the security side of the house. Uh, so we've been working with the major studios, the CDSA, and if you're familiar with the CDSA TPN, um, you know, there is, uh, there's a lot of work on the content production, content delivery side. We work with the ISC uh, locally here to create a couple of templates that are specific to content production in the cloud, uh, one on the uh, VFX rendering in the cloud and the other on content archive and asset management on how do you actually securely create uh, environments for pre-release tier one content. Uh, Thinkbox software is now AWS Thinkbox. So for those who don't know, we acquired Thinkbox over a year ago. Uh, very exciting that we've done a lot of work in terms of natively integrating Thinkbox deadline with EC2 spot. And we just recently changed the branding. So we're, we're ready, very well committed in this space and there's a lot that's happening. A few examples of uh, recent cool work from some of the customers. Uh, Technical or Micros uh, used AWS Spot Fleet for their project Sherlock Gnomes, and as you can read um, here from uh, the quote from Simon, basically they scaled up to 4.5 million render hours. Now that's, as far as I know, that is the largest render project ever done on any cloud. And it's 170,000 simultaneous calls, all on Spot Fleet. And they actually use the Direct Connect Gateway to scale between the AWS Frankfurt region and AWS Dublin region. FuseFX, Jason Fodder is here, um, and he's giving a session later today. Great story how they scaled on AWS. Uh, Passion Pictures is another great story of using 
Thinkbox, Deadline, and Spotfleet. A lot of work we did on remote application streaming. Um, as you know, we have GPU instances. Uh, we now actually have a quick start uh, working with Teradici, which is a one-click deploy uh, mechanism from the AWS uh, uh, Marketplace website. So check that out. Meredith Media, they're here talking with our partner Bebop today about this particular use case on remote application streaming or workstations. And then finally, a lot of investment on the AR VR space with Amazon Sumerian. The idea here is to make it really commodity for our customers so that you don't need to know the intricacies of AR and VR if, we, if you have a tool set to go build what you like, uh, like to and how do you deploy your applications for your consumers. With that, I'll pass it over to Chris to talk about some of the media solutions we've been building. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Usman. Um, hi, my name is Chris Kutan, and uh, I built, or like my team and I, we're building media-specific solutions. So we're using our uh, various AWS services, and like we kind of refer to them as sometimes to like our Lego blocks and put them together into media-specific solutions that can be easily deployed. Click of a button. Usman already mentioned it a little bit before, and yeah, so that's what I'm focused at. Um, before I go there. I, hang on, so I just killed the presentation, no, there we go. Um, quick reminder of what Ben already said, there is various deployment options we have for, on our platform. On the one side, there's the media packages, the media products, we already talked about those. Then there's a very, very strong partner ecosystem, like right after me, one of our key partners in the machine learning space is going to talk about that. And then there is uh, about the solution they, they have deployed. Uh, then there is uh, custom build options. And then there are the AWS core services. And while we build various media solutions, for example, VOD solutions or uh, live streaming solutions uh, and, and others, uh, here I will only focus on machine learning because I don't want to spend the next three hours talking about those solutions. So only on the right side, you see the, the core service machine learning. I'm going to dive into that a little bit further. Before I go there, so I wanted to also to outline another option that was not on the previous slide on how to go about deploying AWS capabilities is with the AWS machine learning lab. So when your use case gets really broad and potentially complicated uh, or not out of the box, so to speak, the machine learning lab is a really good uh, vehicle to, to engage with, where we normally start with a discovery workshop, understanding the use case, identifying maybe the, the right use cases to a degree, and then like dive really deep and you know have machine learning experts, data scientists coming in and like really analyzing your use case, your data, and so forth, and build out a more like a custom use case. But um, Back to the more general services, like, as I mentioned, machine learning services. Here you see the AWS machine learning stack. And one of our key uh, visions, so to, say, so to speak, in the machine learning world is to bring these capabilities, like deep learning, machine learning, like new technologies, new approaches, to a very broad range of developers and data scientists. So the point is, you don't need to be a deep expert in deep learning, neural networks, and so forth in order to use these capabilities. For, and for that purpose, we split the complete capabilities, so to say, into like three layers. And it is kind of from little machine learning knowledge or hardly any machine learning knowledge to deep, deep machine learning knowledge. So on the top layer, you see the application services where we have a vision, then, for example, recognition, recognition video, we have LAX, which is like the like chat for chatbots to build that kind of things. And then we have the language services with transcribe, translate, and comprehend. So that layer, your developers can use by calling APIs. They can build it in any of their products. And basically, that way, use very, very deep, deep learning capabilities in their products, in your product. Then we have the platforms. So if you want to go a little bit deeper, and if the kind of general models are not sufficient for your use case, you can go into the platform, the platform layer with, for example, SageMaker and train your own custom models. Easily deploy them, host them, and so forth. So that's like 
you know, you go from the high level to the mid level. There's also a service called Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk where you can uh, kind of utilize labor to like the, the human element to do training, tagging, and so forth, very easily integrated into the platform. And then there is the bottom layer, uh, which is frameworks. So we, we offer a broad range of frameworks, uh, kind of agnostic there. And then uh, the infrastructure that obviously supports these very compute intense uh, 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 tasks. So here are a couple of use cases. This is along the media supply, or like the complete media value chain, so to speak. A couple of use cases where machine learning is already being used at the moment. Uh, some of them are in development, but some of them are like with customers tested, and some of them are running in production. So on the content creation, post-production side, uh, I don't want to go into like all this like individual ones. I have a couple of demos uh, as part of this presentation, so you're going to see this. But uh, for example, automated highlights creation, right? So you, you, you look for specific events within the video and then create a clip uh, or like a, a highlight around that specific, a clip around that specific highlight. Um, <clears throat> other things are obviously the whole theme of like closed caption, speech to text, uh, and then you know, text to speech even, but also translation services as part of this. Uh, plus then automated compliance marking, making sure certain things don't get on the screen. You know, is it violence? Is it, is it suggestive content? Things like that. Uh, then uh, IP protection, logo brand detection. You, you see it here. So like detecting certain logos within the video streams. And obviously variations of this. It's unbelievable how creative our customers are when we show these kind of more generic use cases and then, okay, let me tune this, let me change this. My content would need that. Lots of conversations and, and projects going on there. And then on the publishing side, we already mentioned it a little bit when it comes to recommendation, you know, um, audience engagement, and so forth. So that's kind of the range where this is used. I want to show a couple of, uh, like actually three demos quickly. So this demo is with sports content, obviously fully applies to normal feature films or whatever. It's basically showing uh, like how we identify persons within the, the video and then uh, like pass their activity across the screen and then identify their faces and things like that. So if you can roll that video, I cannot do it from here, so it will start at some point. Nope, not there. Oh, there. Yeah, there. Okay. So, <laughs> so you see, player is identified, given an ID, followed across the screen, and then uh, the face is identified. We, this is from the Swiss League, for example, so we didn't have these guys pre-trained, uh, and we just used one picture to train for these specific players, and the pictures are literally from the website. So the training was very easy. And then you can go click that person you know, and find him within the video. It gives you obviously the locations, the timestamps within the videos. So think of, it does facial analysis, anything from sentiment to, to uh, you know, like facial features like age and, and so forth, smiling, glasses, beard, and so forth. And then obviously it shows certain tags within the video. For example here, show me all the places where there's a crowd is in the video, so I jump to that crowd, right? So uh, you can think of that like in a, in a movie or whatever, when does the actor, for example, if you're looking at trailers, right, you're placing trailers, where does the actor, when does the actor within the trailer enter the trailer? And if you want, you can bring in like social media feedback loop and say, okay, what's the reaction of my audience to this, right? Are they jumping off? Are they double clicking the, like when that person enters the video? Or, you know, things like that. So you understand very deep what's going on within the video, and then you get a potentially a feedback loop, and then you uh, uh, act on that. Yeah? So if you go to the next one, this is like translate and transcribe. So it just, um, this basically shows how, this really doesn't fully show how these services work together, but it already goes that direction. Obviously the idea is to have these services at some point all work together, right? I give you an example for that. You have 
let's say, a closed caption or like a subtitling use case where you listen to what the speaker is saying and you and the, 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 the AI service is not, let's say, very clear on certain words, right? So people have an accent like myself or, you know, the, the background sound or whatever. So the service would, for example, mark those words as maybe in gray or something like that. Okay, I am not sure about this. It might be this, 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 or this. So then we potentially could also use other services like, for example, recognition video, look into the video, what's going on, and kind of offer up the most likely choice, things like that, right? But in this case, we just show transcribe, which is our transcription service, translate, comprehend, which is like understanding text and then recognition again. So if you can roll this, and that's already from NEB. So there were some major upgrades in, in, in the quality, so we're more than happy to run that wherever. Uh, so you see transcribe. So basically, first you have the transcription, so that's cut off a little bit. But it's, it's, it's logical, right? So you, like, it's, it's obvious. You, you, you transcribe what, this, what the speakers are saying. This is a Rose Parade, it's an extremely noisy video. You translate it right away into various languages, and they're always expanding. I think we just had a major release on that, lots of new languages. Then you go to comprehend, and with comprehend, you look into the more meaning of the text. So you look into key phrases. For example, okay, I missed that. Um, so quantities and locations. So for example, a key phrase could be like marine on a horse. I just know that because it's in that video, right? Or kids in front of a marching band, right? So that means more as a phrase than as like flat text. And then you have recognition, which gives you the objects within that video, uh, and then the facial expressions, but also, for example, reads text within the video, right? So you would see here, it's a prime video, so you would see prime and, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, this information is all given to you in a JSON file and goes, and also gives you like a confidence score. So if you feel like um, you want to cut that down to, at a certain level, you want to have a certain confidence score, you, 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 you can, can modify your applications to that. So let's go to the next one, and that's a very quick one. That's what I mentioned a little bit. That's automated highlight creation. Maybe we roll that right away. Uh, so it basically, we have multiple camera feeds. So we look into like the Jumbotron camera and check if something changes on that specific uh, feed, and whenever, let's say, the score changes or a shot was, give, was, was done, which you also see in the Jumbotron, it creates a clip and, uh, you know, it gives you like 15 seconds before and 10 seconds after, and you basically have the highlights created like that automatically. You can also obviously look for other things as well, and right? you could look for crouchier and things like that, but this is specifically reading that, that thing. So I move on here. Um, as I already mentioned, there's partners and so forth who do like these kind of solutions, but we also spend a lot of time the last couple of months to build these solutions, um, to put these services together so that you can deploy them with the click of a button. And for machine learning, there is the media analysis solution. It already includes these use cases you see there, like automated metadata tagging, transcription, subtitling, context, uh, and, and, and so forth. And we are constantly expanding those. So we're building new solutions. We're listening to customers. What are they using? What, what are more customers than just one using? And then we build the solutions out like that. And you can go and deploy them. Get started very easy. The good thing is they are, they, the solution itself, they don't cost you anything. Right? You just go and deploy them. You use it. You play around. And once you hit, you, you're beyond your, your free tier, Obviously, you pay for the services consumed, right? Um, you see the, address, the email, ad, uh, the, 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 the location, the web location underneath where you can look at those. And by the way, if you're interested in the VOD solution or the live streaming solutions, just remove media analysis and go to media entertainment, and there you see the other solutions as well. Okay? Um, this is just uh, the UI of the solution. Um, and then I already mentioned most of those. Another good thing is they are really, they're well architected and they are scalable. So if you feel you need to go into like a, like a production environment with these kind of solutions, they are, they are built by, you know, senior solution architects from AWS. So this stuff is really, you know, it's not just a, a, a pilot thing, right? It can go into production. And so 
so my call to action really is how to get started, go to this location, and we have a little goodie here. So if you're interested in actually getting started with these kind of solutions, uh, please come and see me uh, after the next presentation. I'm gonna be here, uh, Aaron Terrell is here as well, and uh, we're gonna give out $250 AWS credits, so you can start the solution, get a little uh, uh, code. You can start the solution, try it out. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, contact me, and we work it out, okay? So that's the next one. So I wanna introduce uh, one of our key machine learning partners, Gray Meta, and the chief commercial officer, uh, Josh, from Gray Meta, and he's gonna talk to you about what cool stuff they did. Thanks, Chris. So I think by now, everyone knows there was a wedding back in May, and prior to that, um, William and Kate got married. So with this, we met with Sky, and uh, they started to educate us about the wedding. So when they took us back to 2011, where they talked about the stats of the global viewers and the things that people try to do, and the social media that was growing back then, they said they wanted to be able to do something different. So we went on a journey to try and understand with them more about the wedding. So we've got a different set of stats here. Usman and everyone's been talking about a lot of good technical stuff. So we kind of got into the, well, what's going on? What's the big data of the wedding? So some fun facts here that we had. And the reason why I bring this up is, well, we got into the project with Sky. There was so many crazy ideas that came up around this. And one of the things that you get with a lot of the kind of the hype around machine learning and AI is the blue sky ideas start filling the room and everyone wants to do everything. So we basically went into it and we basically said with them, we know you're gonna have a lot more viewers. We know there's a lot that you want to do. And they came to us and said that we want to make this a mobile first experience. So the goal was to create something mobile first because they weren't trying to insert this into their linear channel feed. They knew that about, I think it was about high 70% of all of their people following were on mobile devices. So one of the things that came up is they wanted to make it real time. So what we did is we worked with them to identify the right partners and we ended up working with Amazon Elemental. And they also wanted to bring a bit more information to the viewers. The idea was they had demographic data that said that the people that wanted to know about the wedding might have been coming home from a work shift. They might have been on the underground. So what they wanted to do was give them information to know why the people were there. And the other thing that was different about this wedding was that it wasn't going to be all your usual heads of state. I mean, it was the Hollywood princess marrying uh, Harry. And they knew there'd be different people there. There was a very high amount of charity-based people that were going to be there. And these weren't necessarily celebrities, but they were people they wanted to recognize. So what Sky wanted to do was create like the bio that explained why people were there. And we were working directly with the editorial team, so they already knew this. They had inside tracks. They were uh, real correspondents. So they built out a whole set of bios about the people and who might be there. The other thing was that the wedding was happening for kind of the five hours I think it was on with all the preamble and then the after wedding. Um, but they wanted to make this an on-demand experience because they knew there would be people that missed it. So they wanted to push this out to social and mobile. But there was one like, kind of issue they were a bit worried about. So this slide actually came up in the first meeting. So we sat there with Sky and they said, we want to do this. We want to just give a little bit more. We want to take a risk here and show that something's possible. And then we'll learn from it and use it in future events, whether it's sporting events, political events. But one of the, the customers in the room, she brought this up on her iPhone. She said, well, how are we going to make sure this doesn't happen? 
right? So this was one of the starting blocks that we had. We needed to make sure that there was 100% accuracy of what got pushed out to the end experience. There was no false positives in it. So one of the key things is how do we build kind of a QC or quality layer into this that didn't add a lot of time? Because again, they wanted something that was as near as real time as possible. So we focused very hard on how are we going to be able to get no false positives, but the big other problem was we didn't know who was going to the wedding. There still isn't really a list. So we had to work with this very broad list of people that might go to the wedding and constantly change it as we went. So with this image, it made us realize that the machine learning part of it was going to be key with how are we going to build the models, how are we going to get the training set data, and what was the right partner to do this with. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of blue sky ideas that come up when people think about what's possible because they're at home with their Alexa and their Siri, so they think everything's kind of AI. So what we did is we really focused hard, and we did this in about three days with them. We said, if you want to do this, and we can't move the date of the wedding, we're going to have to put some serious controls in place. So Gray Meadow was hired to kind of manage the whole project for them and bring in the right partners that were needed. So it wasn't that they just came to us and said, hey, we need some machine learning, or we need a little bit of AI. They needed a solution that would go directly from the camera at the event all the way to these people on their mobile phones or their laptops or iPads sitting on the sofa at home or on the underground. So we locked in very quickly the requirements of the project. And early on in the first couple of meetings, people said, well, maybe we can have an overlay and uh, we can do advertising and someone can buy David Beckham's jacket or, or, or different people's clothing. Or what are they wearing? What kind of um, makeup would they have on? So we kind of shot all those ideas down, locked the scope down, agreed that the timeline was very, very tight. This was happening third week of February. We were in these meetings and the wedding was May 19th. We also wanted to make sure that we, we met the goal. So there's a lot of things we took off the table in the early stages, because again, it was a mobile first experience. And one of the challenges that came up was how do you do this on a iPhone and an Android and all the different devices, but they didn't want to break into the plumbing of the Sky mobile app that was already there. I mean, people were going there already, but we didn't want to make them download another app. So what we did is we went out to try and find the best solution to be able to have a link in the, in the actual app that took someone to a web or a mobile experience that didn't mean they had to go and download another app. And we found a great partner for that to do that. And we wanted to make sure we avoided scope creep. And when we went through, it was about three weeks into the project that we actually locked down all the key partners and their roles and stakeholders. And that's when we knew that we couldn't, avoid, we couldn't have any scope creep, so we kind of ran it for a very tight PMO process through this. There was a lot of unknowns, or considerations as we've called it, and we've had this presentation around the world with Sky and with Amazon. But we knew the location was going to be where they picked, but we had to get out there and understand what was going to happen. One of the things with facial recognition or even listening to audio in video elements is if there's noise in the background or there's a shadow or it's obstructed by a tree or something. So we had to go out to the event location. The live camera here wasn't actually from the broadcast that we were working with. This was actually a BBC fixed camera feed or the requirement or we were told it's a fixed camera. We'll get to that it wasn't in a little bit. The weather was another variable, right? But if you got everybody and it's sunny, we're going to have some crazy hats that you'd have at a wedding and crazy sunglasses. If it was raining, we'd have umbrellas. So we had to go out and kind of build for this to say, well, let's go and do a test run with a bunch of people with umbrellas. And let's build a model with people with umbrellas walking in. And then the viewer experience that we talked about had to be simple and clean, not too overcomplicated. And the big kind of elephant in the room was the guest list. We didn't know who was going. So we ended up building a list of about 3,000 people working with the recognition team. And the other thing was a lot of the, the training data was like a celebrity photo or something from a charity event or a rugby player. And it was, so what we had to do is get the good and the bad photos, the high resolution ones, them with a hat on, them all makeup, them looking like they just got out of bed. So we kind of had a training set that was very diverse. And then the other weird one, if you do any Googling of royal wedding videos, they wear some crazy hats. So a lot of what we did is we knew people would be wearing crazy hats, and we had to build that when we went in and built the models. So I talked about time wasn't on our side. And one of the things that we've seen with customers that we're working with and other partners is people can spend three months thinking about what they're going to do. And that's one of the challenges. So what we said, if you want to do this, you just got to get going. We said, we are going to run into some problems along the way, but we're going to put the right framework and resource so that we run into a problem, we can resolve it. And we did. We ran into problems right up until the last week, but it was, it was handled working with the project team. So th the point of this slide is you don't need to spend a year figuring it out. You can spend a few weeks and understand what you want to do. And with the stuff we've heard this morning from Usman and Chris, the, the tools are, are there at your fingertips. Many of you are probably Amazon customers already using and playing around with this. But the key is you've got to start to be able to get there. And if you kind of procrastinate and say, oh, I really want to do this, I don't quite know about it, so you've got to take a bit of a risk. And that's what Sky did. And it set them up very well to try this on other events that they're working on, political stuff, sports events. And what we've now done, working with the Elemental Amazon team, is condense this down to about six weeks. 
So we're actually taking this to market as a packaged offering where we can actually go in and say, well, if you've got an event in three months, you gotta start by then. And the idea is that as you go through the process with the testing, the design, the build, you can ramp up your elemental and AWS environment for the first few weeks for testing. You can test it for the production event. And the other thing that we did, which is uh, why we ended up working with Amazon, was we needed live event services. So when you start thinking about machine learning and putting it into a live experience or a high volume consumer app, you gotta plan for the bad times. What about if it falls over? How do you get redundancy? So one of the great things with the AWS Elemental team is we leverage the same kind of backbone services as they use for the NFL Thursday night uh, football. So we knew that we'd have global reach, we knew we'd have redundancy. So I think it was about a three month timeline uh, once we locked down the project scope and we think now we can uh, do this in about six to eight weeks um, working with the uh, AWS Elemental team. We did try to get it under 60 seconds. Um, straight away, we said it's not gonna happen in real time, especially if you want QC. I mean, we can chat about it for a month and pretend it's real time and then come to a reality that's not. So very quickly we said, no, not gonna happen. But 60 seconds was enough because what we wanted to do is build in the human element. So we've talked about the editorial team. This wasn't all done with Gray Meta and with Amazon. We, the customer was heavily involved here because they had a lot of the data that we needed to train the model, to get the bio. They knew, obviously, the wedding better than we did. So what we did, is we built in an element of QC. So at the super high level here, and again, not going into uh, as technical as some of the earlier presentations, is we had to acquire the content. So we did that with the uh, Elemental Live Encoder services, connecting into the BBC camera. Um, we also did actually try with the uh, new camera that they talked about, but just time wasn't quite on our side to throw something like that in. But going forward again, we used the uh, camera that has the machine learning built into it. Then once the content was encoded, we brought that all into the Gray Meta platform, and then what we were doing is we created a curation and QC step. The other thing that we were doing is we tapped into some social feeds. So because there was a lot of talk as the wedding got closer about who might be going, who they were, who they were related to, someone was annoyed because someone got invited and they didn't. There was a lot of global chatter around this. So we were listening to the social feeds of everyone we were building a model for. And that feedback loop allowed the editorial team to start to get more information, to go out there and get better photos, to build the model better. So there was a feedback loop for social. And then the content streaming, we used um, CloudFront and the uh, Amazon uh, live event services. And then we partnered with a company called UICentric, who is a uh, Amazon partner, and they had a lot of experience with sports and live events. So they created that last mile application that sat up there. And then the analytics that they had, they haven't released the data. Um, they were very impressed with um, the viewership of it. And I think they found that the VOD experience had a, a very good uptake and they were able to reuse that more than they were the direct traffic of someone that was watching it during the event. And the other thing that we did is um, Sky uses Adobe. So one of the things here was how do we get this data back in to the editorial process to very quickly create the VOD offering? Because we found out that we thought everyone would enter the front door of the chapel via this camera, but that wasn't the case. I believe Elton John and Oprah came in through a back door, so no one knew about that. So we had to have an angle to quickly go in, and every frame of Elton John that was now in the VOD video footage, we could go through and quickly label that as Elton John. And one of the things here is with Adobe, and we're also now on the future projects bringing in the Bebop guys, because you wanna be able to spin up a resource to do all this editing from the live event to get it into a VOD offering. And the idea there is that uh, within a Bebop environment, the customer can spin it up for three or four months, do all of the editing, now you've got your VOD product, spin it down, and then wait for the next event. So I talked about this, a lot of pre-training that was done. Um, and again, this uh, presentation can be shared and you can, we can go through into more detail, anyone that's interested. The pre-training was key and we worked with the recognition team because it wasn't just about getting a full-on facial of this. We had to look for dark images. We lightened the images, we, we pixelated them. We found ones where they were obscured because one of the things was we couldn't have kind of false positives going through. And we've seen a lot of stuff around making sure it's accurate. So we locked in a 100% rate that it had to go out. And the UI that we showed in the video, we allowed their users to go through and manually check it. They had a 45 second window for when it came through the processing. It was processed in about six seconds. It had come through, they had 45 seconds to curate it and check it. And then they would hit the submit button. And that was the same as a QC operator blessing a file in a QC house saying it's good to go. You had the human touch on it and they pushed it through. This is something that we did um, yep. show that you've got to go out there and um, 
actually test this. Don't just go and think, oh, I've got everything figured out. One of the issues that we had here, so we went out with Sky Teams, and we wanted to see where people were walking from. And the data that we got from this going out to the site twice, and they did a pretend wedding on the Sky lot, is this allowed us to adjust the model that we were training. And we knew that it was more slight side profiles of faces that were going to be key for us. And we built models that allowed for a partial overlay of another face in front of somebody else. And there was a clip in there that lady that got told off. She apparently stole the hymn sheet from the chapel and someone chased after us. So that's, that's what happened to the lady in the red coat. Um, we talked about leveraging the CDN services and the cloud storage of AWS and UI centric. And this is the curation UI that we had to do. So we, we built this with Sky and this is now in our platform. And we've extended this not just to facial, but logos, objects, things that you might find because they wanted to make sure that they had good, clean data. And what you're seeing here is using any open source model Kind of Elton John could kind of be Prince Harry. I guess it's the hair color and the eyes. And that's what happens without the model. So what we did is we built a UI um, working with the Sky team. And they quickly would go through. They'd have their 45 seconds. They could quickly label it. And this is what we did is we were getting secondary camera footage in. So when you get extra camera after the event, we could quickly put it up into S3. The system would uh, process it. And now the operators would sit there uh, in the editorial room. And they could quickly go through here and, and save it. And on they would go. Resource used, this is a key thing. It didn't take that many people. It did take a coordinated effort. So when we got engaged with the right resources at Elemental and Amazon, we kind of went into a cadence of kind of a weekly call. It was only in the last couple of weeks that we kind of sped that up to a daily call. But it didn't take a lot of resource to make this happen. Um, it used existing technology It was there. It was kind of tweaking the workflow. And I think the key thing here was once we knew the objective of the project, it, it was about the solution. It wasn't about do I have the right machine learning model or the engine or this or the algorithm. It was really about getting the end-to-end -end workflow because you have the best model in the world, but if we couldn't come in from the elemental workflow directly into our platform and hand it off to the UI app in that amount of time, it would have all fallen over. Training set we've talked about, uh, this is key. Um, they talked about it earlier. A lot of the tools that are available directly from Amazon or companies like us or other companies out there, you've really got to focus on the training set and keep building that training set. Hurdles, we've talked about this. There was a lot of false positives that we had early on. We had a few challenges. These two ladies are identical twins. We got them right, so a lot of extra work was done to build a facial model around the two identical twins. We definitely had a bit of a hiccup in the last uh, week. This rugby player, as you can see, he's got a bit of a dodgy nose. He had a nose job done. And he started, his confidence scores would go down once he had his nose job, so we retrained him. So there's a lot of stuff on the fly that we had um, as we were going through getting the model accurate. And the lady with the crazy hat. So the overall solution, uh, again, we, we plugged it in with the AWS services. I think what helped is, because this is a national broadcaster, this thing couldn't fall over. So we had to find someone that had the ability to lean on the machine learning, scale up for the compute. Um, there was going to be a lot of US traffic. And Sky being the UK broadcaster, the normal products aren't necessarily supporting US traffic. So this is why we leveraged the uh, CDN services of Amazon. And the end result here, so again, it was a very clean user experience. Um, Sky is now working on other projects tied to facial recognition, speech to text, to give a different type of offering or sports events. Um, the idea was it was very clean, had to be mobile first. And it's just a little clip of what that looked like on the website. And I believe it's still live. So the idea was they pushed this out on their website. As people were coming up, you can see that it was just people in front of other people. So it's finding who it is as they walk through. And they wanted to just have something different. So they did get a big increase in traffic. They marketed it pretty heavily. And you've got all the people there, all the buyers were behind it. And in a minute, it's going to go to the VOD offering, which is where they had a lot of success because they were republishing uh, that around based on things that were trending. And again, we didn't interrupt their existing ecosystem. So they've got their online video platform, all their ad networks. We didn't try and get into that. It wouldn't have been able to get done in the, in the uh, three-month period. Now we're going to go to the VOD thing. I can't forward up here. This is a bit long. And the VOD one was where they had a lot of traffic on the click through because what they were doing is they were looking um, for the people that were there and they could go through and watch them and scan around. And they were clipping this into little moments so they could push back out. So again, we had accuracy. We didn't get any misses with the names. Um, it was in the 80% in the of people that we found that were accurate because the others were where it was three people stood in front of each other and we went through and used the creation tool to very quickly label them in the sub 60 seconds. 
So with that, I think Usman was going to come in. Uh, is Usman around here? Is just going to go into a bit more detail on some of the elemental side of things. So um, I'll quickly walk you guys through the uh, workflow here. So as Josh pointed out, the uh, requirement here was for both live and VOD. And the idea was that how can we do um, sort of say uh, facial recognition on the fly for that, right? So on the left-hand side on the screen, uh, you'll see there is the, uh, the camera in the chapel. Uh, there is an elemental encoder box on premises which is actually encoding the content as it comes through and then pushing it straight into Elemental Media Live, uh, which is our live streaming uh, service fully managed in AWS I talked about earlier. So uh, basically they're spinning up a live channel on demand in the cloud that is connected to the uh, Media Live, uh, to the Elemental Live box. Then from there, Elemental Live pushes it into um, a media package, uh, which is actually packaging the content and it not only uh, sends the, 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 the live stream out via the CDN or CloudFront in this case, um, but at the same time it does a couple of things. One is where it is actually storing the content or pushing it into S3 for the WAD offering, but at the same time, uh, the integration with Gray Meta, as Josh talked about in detail, right? How do you plug that interface into um, the elemental media package to be able to then pick it up and then recognition with that custom model. And then uh, basically once those, that analysis is done, then it's sent over to the UI-centric uh, UI, mobile, mobile UI interface that is built for that. So basically this is a complete end-to-end -end workflow. And as Josh pointed out, end-to-end -end 60 seconds or under 60 seconds and you know, with high reliability or uptime that is possible or was possible in this particular case with uh, media services fully managed. Right, thanks Usman. So I think to summarize here, it was done in about three months. We think we're under about two now. We've set it up in a way that can be deployed within um, your Amazon subscription. Um, so it can all be spun up, so the elemental pieces and the AWS, um, and you can use your choice of um, the NUI. Um, we've had some customers that have their own UI team, so it's very easy to plug in if they're used to plugging into the AWS elemental world. Um, and again, we didn't use anything, we didn't have to build anything new. We were just using existing things that were available within Amazon and spent our time optimizing that technology. Um, and I think we found here that just by adding a human layer in does not have to slow things down. It wasn't like we added three hours because we put a human layer in. We got a lot of value by adding that QC layer in and added about a minute or so, and you had the quality. We didn't have any errors. There was no false, false positives, and it allowed them to really enrich that content to use again and again. So um, that's it. So I'll crack on, have a go at it. And uh, again, it worked, and it was something that we did, and we're doing more of it now with the Amazon team. We're about to go and launch this for uh, some projects in Australia and India with them. So again, it can work anywhere, and that's one of the reasons why we've packaged it up. So thank you.